I'm here with Harlan Hugh, inventor of the brain and one of the world's largest brain creators, Jerry Mikulski. Jerry, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we have your brain here on Wander Mode at the Brain Technologies. And I wanted to ask you, how does your brain express who you are? Well, lots of different ways, actually. And when I notice it a lot is when I show it to people. I'll be mm -hmm. at some event, and I'll be taking notes on the event, and somebody will say, what's that? And I'll start showing it. And I realize that the places that I show are things that I care a lot about a lot very deeply. And so I'll go into these parts of my brain that will express what I'm into or um, my particular perspective or point of view about a, a topic, some of which are maybe difficult topics like the Gulf War uh, or things like that. So they can be political, they can be about interests, uh, they can be about investments or whatever else. And over time, as I've built stuff into my brain, it turns out to manifest what I care about really beautifully. And how does your brain, how did you decide, where did you get started on your brain? Well, this guy named Harlan showed up in my office to show this product uh, uh, more than 11 years ago. And uh, uh, his business partner was at the head of the table with a PowerPoint deck, and he said, you know, I have this feeling we shouldn't actually use the deck at all. Harlan, why don't you just show Jerry the brain? And we started on the demo, and I got it right away, and I started using it about a month later, just before they announced and released the product for general public availability. And so I got a really early start on it and have been using it ever since, um, linearly, all the time, consistently. And over these 11 plus years, I've put in 107,000, almost 500 thoughts or nodes in, in my brain. And how does the brain differ from other tools and maybe even more typical mind maps? Would you consider this a mind mapping technology or something completely different? I put it under sort of visual search, visual analysis, concept mapping, mind mapping. Those are the kinds of thoughts I actually have the brain under uh, in my brain. And uh, people look at the brain and they go, ooh, ooh it's 3D. And I, I usually correct them. I say, no, I, I think of it as 2 and a quarter D. Because in general, you're in flat land. It's a pretty flat interface. Except there's this animation that we're seeing right now where things pop up and then back, settle back down onto the page. That's the quarter D. But what that does is it frees your mind to actually associate any thought with any other thought. So there's no hierarchy here. And the problem with the 2D products that are basically page-oriented is that once you get to the right edge of the page, you can't actually connect up with things that are on the left edge of the page. And nothing else is moving into the center and becoming the hub of activity. So uh, there's this enormous difference from this not being hierarchical, from it allowing that extra little space of motion and I've seen a couple of experimental, really 3D, fly-through-the-data kind of applications. And they're mostly miserable because you can't easily, accurately, and quickly fly through information. It's not a good navigational metaphor. And yet here, we can actually jump to things very directly and you can navigate through a whole bunch of information very quickly in this strange two-and-a-quarter D world. And Harlan, when you created the brain, did you were you thinking about um, Tony Buzen's mind maps, or how does that relate to Jerry's usage and experience of this sort of non-linear, um, non-linear way of, of connecting information? Well, when I first started working on the brain, part of the uh, sort of core premise was that we needed a way to uh, connect information associatively rather than hierarchically. And um, I'd actually never heard of a mind map until uh, a couple of years after having uh, built a prototype for a personal brain. And uh, so, so that's why the brain looks so much different than a typical mind map, um, since it sort of takes a completely different approach. Rather than being based on a piece of paper, it's based on what's inside your head. Is your brain as big as Jerry's? <laughs> uh, my digital one is not. <laughs> okay. How big are you? How big is your brain now? How many uh, thoughts are you up to, Jerry? It's 107,500. I think that is the yeah. record. So, where do you see this technology going? You've been using the technology now, Jerry, for over a decade in Harlem. Of course, you've been working on it uh, for that long. Um, what's the future of the brain? Well, I think. It's funny, a long time ago, at least five years ago, more like seven, eight, nine years ago, but after I'd been using the brain for a while, I was on a genealogy site, myancestry.com or myfamily.com, I don't remember which one, and I was entering some stuff about my family, 
And then I read up on what does it mean to enter some genealogical information. And it turns out that if you have a couple of pieces of information, you, you sort of certify or you validate that this is a real individual and that it's a unique individual. So birth record, death record, whatever. And then it dawned on me that someday as I expanded my little, my little very tiny family tree, I would click into somebody who already existed in this database, who was already validated, and I would suddenly be connected to the sort of the tree of mankind. And that was a big aha. I, I sat there and I went, ooh, that would feel really interesting. I would, that would feel very connective. And then because I'd already been using the brain and I was heavily into it, I had the same extended thought for the brain, which was, wouldn't it be cool if my little dendritic connections here, the things that I've been weaving for you know, over a decade by myself, what if I could weave them into Harlan's and yours and other people's out there in the world and other people who are experts in other sorts of domains and make those kinds of connections? This would be, be the beginning of a global brain. And I think that's where this thing goes long term. And maybe it takes us another decade to get there. But I think, in fact, when I give speeches without talking about the brain at all, I talk about how what's happening today is that we're weaving a global brain. When I friend somebody on Facebook, that seems like a little trivial act, but I've just created a little connection between us. And when I do something, that'll show up in your mini-feed. And when you do something, it'll show up in mine. And when I tweet something and, you know, a couple thousand people hear that thing that I tweeted, those couple people saw me out of the periphery of their vision. And they might or might not remember me, but that's a very thin little neural connection in this new global brain. So the brain, the product, allows for this kind of playing with uh, information in that way, in a very natural, fluid form. So I think it's a really important aspect, a really, really important element of weaving this new global brain. And Harlan, are you, uh, without giving away anything uh, uh, too confidential, can you get, let, let us know? Uh, are you in agreement with Jerry's vision? Where do you see the technology going? Will, will Jerry be working on his global brain in the future? Uh, well, uh, the, as the name of the current product implies, uh, personal brain, um, the, uh, the current product is focused on an individual um, and, uh, and how one person can work in their sort of digital space. Um, but obviously that's not uh, the only possibility with this, with this technology. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, we see happening as we move forward here, just as Jerry described, is basically the blurring of the line between what's personal and what's shared. Um, and really, the intermingling of those two spaces to the point where uh, that line doesn't really exist so much uh, as it's a continuum. Uh, and your brain starts to develop into the global brain, as Jerry said. Interesting. Now let's go back to today. Um, what kind of user, other than uh, somebody with uh, over 100,000 thoughts in their brain, would use the brain? What kind of people are using the technology? Um, Harlan and Jerry, who, who do you think this technology best suits? Mm -hmm. If I can take a, a crack at that first, maybe. I think there are a few very, very different kinds of people for whom the brain is very attractive. One of them is visual thinkers, people who see things as concepts, people who, who normally, habitually, would take out a sheet of paper and draw a little bubble diagram and make lists for themselves, who've tried a lot of these concept mapping tools. So they're the obvious natural audience. But there's also people um, who think that their history, that their breadcrumbs in cyberspace are actually important. And they may not be very visual at all, but they may not sort of notice so much that they see interesting websites, they go through the world, they, they annotate, they remember, but they have no place to actually bank and put these things into a broader context. And I think those people who value what they've found and want to make it make much more sense would be really wonderfully attracted to the brain as well. Um, and so, in some sense, if you try to take care of your bookmarks in your browser now and then, and you find that really frustrating, this is a really great alternative to that. Uh, I mean, basically, in my vision for how the product was uh, originally conceived, the idea was that everyone would use the brain, of course. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, some people are, are more suited to the technology uh, in the way they think, in the way they work. Um, basically, the, the core idea behind the product when we started was to be able to say, let's create a workspace that can more closely match the way people think on their computer. 
Um, and so to that end, you know, we're always trying to make something that can work for everyone, of course. Um, but uh, uh, in practice, when we've, uh, we've actually started deploying the, the product and, and getting customers and so forth, of course, uh, we've seen that uh, there's a high concentration of people who are uh, uh, real uh, thinkers, I guess, uh, analysts, um, who are uh, dealing with a lot of different complex uh, types of information um, and complex relationships in their daily lives, um, and they need help to capture that uh, on their computers. Um, uh, interestingly enough, one of the, uh, the highest uh, percentages of, uh, of users in terms of uh, titles uh, we get registered on our, on, our, on our site is people who are the presidents or CEOs of companies. Um, the sort of entrepreneurial mindset, I guess, um, sort of syncs up well with, uh, with the personal brain and, and uh, that type of uh, thinking and working. One thing just to, it's really easy, I, I've got this huge brain that I've been feeding for 11 years, and it's a little bit like uh, using the Wikipedia as an example for good wikis. It's completely daunting. So people go, oh my god, I could never do that. So Wikipedia is actually a bad example for trying to help people use their own wiki and develop a wiki for internal uses or for private uses or for small group uses because it's just so big and so full of, of information that so many people have contributed to. Um, instead, just think, if you could organize a hundred of your favorite bookmarks into some useful way, into some useful form, wouldn't that be better than what you're using today? So, even at the entry level, it's immediately useful, and it doesn't have to be for very complicated or sophisticated applications. Very, very simple things. It's just, it's more a matter, from my perspective, of whether your brain sees things associatively or not. And if it does, chances are this is a pretty good fit. Uh, 